Hello, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Ben, I used to work in the games industry, now I work in the finance industry, and I have this talk, Identifying Monoids. And the reason I have this talk is that in a couple of talks I gave last year, I got questions. Uh, in the talk I gave about declarative style and another talk I gave about operator overloading, I got a question uh, a couple of times, I think from Simon, at least once, um, saying, how, how should we identify monoids in code? Because I'd made this claim that identifying monoids is one of the best things you can do, A, to help your users as a library writer, designer, but B, also I've come to realize to help yourself. Uh, <clears throat> because when we recognize monoids, it, you get that understanding of what the code can really do, and you get maybe an understanding of uh, things, things that it can now do that you realize it can do that, that you didn't really think about to begin with, and sort of stuff you get for free. And uh, for your users, they get, they get the idea of uh, things being already uh, familiar, that ha not having to learn how each different thing works, but having to learn one pattern which is ubiquitous, this idea of the monoid. They don't have to puzzle out how each thing works. Now to begin with, I just want to get this out of the way. Some of you may have heard about monads. Monads are very popular in functional programming. You hear a lot about them. Uh, I just wanted to make this crystal clear that monoids are not the same thing as monads. In fact, to my mind, they're much simpler. Um, if you talk to category theorists, they'll claim that, you know, they'll say a monad's a monoid in the category of endofunctors. That's, that's not what we're about today. Um, in fact, I'm probably going to say things that mathematicians would take issue with because this talk is grounded in real code for the most part. Um, so I'll be sort of interchangeably using the terms fold or accumulate or reduce. You can view them all as meaning the same thing. So what's a monoid? Well, as I said, it's very simple. It's simple enough that a grade school child knows what it is, even if they don't know the mathematical terms. So you've got a set of values, like, say, the integers. You've got a binary operation, like, say, addition. And the important thing, that, that operation has to be closed. So when you add two integers, you don't get something else. You get an integer. And it has to be associative. It doesn't necessarily have to be commutative. We'll see plenty that are, but there are plenty of useful ones that aren't. And then the third thing a monoid has is one special value. That's the identity, or sometimes called the unit. Uh, in the case of integers and addition, that would be 0. So, And you probably already know what it is without me telling you. It doesn't change when under, uh, under the addition, you know, you add 0 to anything, it stays the same. So 0 is the identity. So my goal with this talk, having given you that context, is to show you a whole lot of examples of monoids. Uh, some that will be obvious to you, perhaps. Some, hopefully, that won't be. Um, because the way that our brains work as humans is by constructing pattern matching, right? You learn how to think about something by seeing lots of different examples, and your brain automatically will figure out what the distinguishing features are, what's relevant and what's not relevant. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you can go and look at your own code, or you know, maybe halfway through the talk, you'll be thinking about your own code and thinking, wow, I recognize that pattern. So that's my goal to uh, build a sense for spotting monoids in the wild and intuition for knowing where they might be lurking. So we'll start obvious. I already told you about addition on integers, on numbers. So for integers, read any kind of number. Multiplication, the uh, identity is 1. And uh, I, so I talked about the properties uh, uh, that it has to have. Remember, it has to be associative. Uh, binary operation is associative, and we need an identity. So that's what we're looking for. So as the integers, many, many things that are like numbers. Um, obviously, integers, real numbers, also complex numbers. Uh, vectors in the mathematical sense, if you think about a member-wise addition, addition on vectors, thinking about multiplication on vectors is actually not a monoid because a dot product is not closed. You don't, you don't get a vector by a dot product of two vectors. Uh, and the uh, cross product is not, uh, is not uh, has no identity, right? Because a cross product of two vectors is always perpendicular to the two vectors. 
Um, but any of these, you can, you can use point-wise, member-wise addition. And so you could use accumulate or fold expressions or whatever we have in C++. Uh, matrices is the first thing that we meet normally in our mathematical career that is not commutative matrix multiplication, but it's still associative, and that's all we need to be a monoid. Okay, so those are kind of the obvious things that are number-like. <clears throat> Let's think more about different operations. Um, max and min are monoids, uh, and it's easy to think about max on the positive integers because the, the identity is zero. Uh, it's harder to think about min because the identity in a mathematical sense is, you know, there, there is no, it's infinity, but infinity is not a number really. Um, but in C++, of course, we don't deal with infinities much. We can just use numeric limits, max. And the mirror images of these, you know, so negative integers and min, etc. Boolean values also offer us good examples of monoids. Again, kind of easy to think about. Uh, there's a reason why in these fold expressions, um, the, the uh, and fold expression evaluates to true if you have an uh, empty parameter pack. And likewise, an or fold expression evaluates to false if you have an empty parameter pack. And that's because the identity value for and is true, and the identity value for or is false. If you or anything with false, you get back what the thing was, similarly and. So these, uh, these fold expressions work for us because of the, the existence of the monoid on and and or, in particular because of the identities. There's uh, one more you might meet with Boolean values, and that's exclusive or. So if you look at this truth table, it's a little harder to think about than and and or because we use it less often, perhaps. Uh, but you can see that the identity is false. Just taking a look at the lines of the truth table, you can see that wherever you have false, you get back whatever the other thing is. And it's worth noting, obvious after you hear it, but not obvious before you hear it, perhaps, that exclusive or is the same operation as not equal to. You can just convince yourself of that by looking at the truth table. All right, so those were a few sort of starter monoids. Let's take a look at some of the, some of the accumulation style algorithms we have in C++ so that when you see these algorithms crop up in your code, uh, you've got a clue as to there might be a monoid lurking. Well, the obvious ones, uh, accumulation style algorithms, accumulate would be an obvious one. Um, and reduce, it basically does the same thing. The things I said at the top of the talk that I'd be using interchangeably, accumulate, reduce, fold expressions. Fold is you know, another sort of keyword in this sense. Many of the algorithms in numeric are variations on accumulate, so we've got uh, transform, reduce, and a whole bunch that were added with 17. All of these make you kind of clue you into there might be a monoidal structure in the code. There's a few others uh, we can think about based on the monoids I just showed you. These are also clues. So all of and any of, they're those fold expressions over the Booleans and Boolean and and Boolean or, and none of is you know, a variation of that. Uh, find and friends are also, you know, they're what all of and any of are, are built on, so they're underlying. And the min and the max element. And then count and count if are sort of monoidal where the operation is increment, right? So um, they're, they're that same structure of underlying code. Now, find here, short circuits, so it's not quite an accumulate, but as I said, I've sort of been fa playing fast and loose with mathematics, but concentrating on code structure. So there are a couple of useful reformulations of accumulate that I found useful that I would, I'd love to see more examples in the standard of algorithms that end with underscore n, because almost every algorithm, there's a few that have underscore n, there's copy n and fill n and a few, but all of them could do with having an n added for an alternate formulation. Uh, I've used this algorithm, for instance, in a sliding window type calculation where you need to um, accumulate up the window's worth of stuff, and then you can easily slide it along one just by you know, a simple take away the first one, add the, add the last one sort of thing. Here is another. Now, this is almost identical to accumulate in the standard. 
Uh, the only difference here is that in the standard, uh, when we call this operation, the iterator gets dereferenced. Right, so normally you would write your binary operation to pass to accumulate, and you write it in terms of the values of the iterators. It turns out if you, pa if you pass the iterator through, you can, you can use iterators to accumulate. And uh, in, in a talk I gave a couple of years ago, which was sort of exploring the algorithmic empire of accumulate, um, for fun, but in working up that talk, I, I tried to write as many of the algorithms, standard algorithms as I could in terms of accumulate. Like I just sat down one day and I said, well, here's accumulate. I'll try and write all the other algorithms and not use a loop in any of them. And so in C++14, there were about, I think, 90 algorithms. There are more than that now, but there were 90 in C++14. Of those, 77 of them had this accumulate style structure in some way. All right, let's see some more examples. By the way, you can stop me at any time and ask a question. I will either answer it or tell you it's going to be answered soon or, or save it to the end. <clears throat> uh, probably the most famous monoid in functional programming is it's called the free monoid, uh, and it's concatenation on strings with the empty string as, as the identity. This is notably not commutative. And um, it, it's hard to understand why it's called the free monoid. Free in that sense just means it's, it's purely everything that a monoid needs and nothing that it doesn't need. That, at least that's the way I interpret it. So, so you, get, you get nothing else except just the properties of the monoid. Kind of the most generic monoid in that sense. <clears throat> so there are lots of stringish applications in C++. Um, one of them, for example, is, is here, accumulating things into a stream, right? Now, we don't generally tend to use string plus string plus string plus string because the compiler can't see through all those temporaries very well. It's not particularly efficient. But we do do things like this, where we put strings into streams. And so what's happening here is conceptually an accumulation into a string. That string happens to be in the real world. And we happen to have a projection function, because this is taking, this is effectively a template. You know, we, can, we have a projection function which is turning any old type we give it into a string and then accumulating it into the string in the real world. So in, here's a, for, a formulation of, of join that does that, that might be, you know, you might have seen something similar in Boost or in your code bases. This is one that I happen to use. In C++20, I get, and again, this is a kind of accumulation where you've got this projection function. In C++20, we're getting, um, Ostream joiner, which does something super similar to this, and join in ranges. I'm not sure if we're getting join standardized in 20, but it's certainly in the ranges algorithm set. Um, and with ranges, the monoidal structure here becomes a bit clearer because it tends to separate that projection function from the actual accumulation and provide that lazy conversion. So, so strings are one thing, but anything that's sort of string-ish um, is susceptible to this, this, this the free monoid. So schedules is a, an example I found in, in my code, for, again, from a couple of talks ago. Uh, and here, we're not using an operator, so it's perhaps less obvious, uh, but the dot then function is the monoidal operation. It's concatenating schedules here, and there is, a, there is an identity which is the schedule that is just empty, the schedule of zero seconds. So this is an example I found in old code, and I think you know, this is a monoidal example, but, but where it's dot then as the operation. And it's, and it's certainly associative, as you can sort of convince yourself if you think about it for a, for a minute. So we've looked at mathematical things. We've looked at stringish things. <clears throat> Let's look at... So th those are kind of primitives in, well, you know, prim string is a primitive in many languages, and you might think of it as a primitive in C++, as a primitive sort of type that you would use, uh, vocabulary type. Uh, but let's look at how to combine 
uh, monoids. So how would we do containers? Well, we already saw, uh, we already saw that uh, complex numbers were, and things where we could do point-wise addition. So that's exactly the case for containers as well. So any container is monoidal on its value type, which is to say we can point-wise, we can member-wise apply, and I've got pluses here just for the sake of exposition, but this could be any monoid operation. Any, you know, this is a container of ints, but you could have a container of strings with concatenation or a container of complex numbers with multiplication or whatever. Um, and so that's a vector, so that's fairly easy to think about. When we think about maps, and it could be unordered map, but associative containers, then this gives us the idea as to why identity is so important, because we are, we are performing the monoid operation on the mapped type here. And if there is no entry in the map, so in this case, Alice didn't work any hours in February, and so what are we gonna accumulate for Alice? Well, we need to have that identity. And so conceptually, Alice worked zero hours in February. Zero is the identity. And Charlie worked zero hours in January. So the identity is, is crucial for things like this. <clears throat> uh, and pure functions work this way too because um, if a function is pure, i.e. The, the outputs only depend on the inputs and not on any cached state or global stuff, um, you can imagine that you can implement that function with a, with a map, with a lookup table. So they have the same, uh, they have the same kind of structure. So it's a, that's when things are all the same type. So if we have structs and pairs and tuples, the, the, the contained types are different. So we're going to need potentially more than one monoid to combine them. Good example of this is complex numbers in polar form. So remember that to, to multiply two complex numbers, we would multiply the, the magnitude, the uh, modulus, and we add together the angles or the arguments. And my second example here is if we had uh, some profiling data, so a, a function, a function from ints to ints, let's say, and how long that function took to run, how would we compose those, how would we add up those things? Well, we would add the run times and we would compose the functions by feeding the output of one to the input of the next one. I'll have a bit more about that later. <clears throat> the, uh, another monoid you often meet in real life is the, the, the monoids on sets. So, and they're very similar to you know, addition, they have, uh, union is probably, you know, what you would think of as very similar to addition. So the identity is the empty set. For intersection, the identity is a little trickier to represent sometimes, but it's the, basically conceptually the universal set, the set that contains everything. Uh, this monoid, or I should say the set union monoid, is the one that sort of I had a epiphany about uh, and made me realize how useful monoids were because I discovered, I discovered this uh, when I was working late one night and I sort of finished what I was doing and I was walking around the office and I, and I, found, and I, I found my friend Simeon working. Uh, he's not a C++ engineer, he codes JavaScript normally. But he was working on this thing and he was uh, having a problem because he just had, uh, he wanted to uh, collect a bunch of properties. So he was treating JavaScript objects as bags of properties and he had a function that would allow him to take two of them and basically merge them, right? Uh, but he had, he had a whole bunch of them that he, wanted to, that he wanted to merge. And so he was like, there must be a better way than just looping over them. And I, and I was talking to him for a few minutes, and at that point, I wasn't really, I just started my sort of study into functional programming, so I didn't twig immediately. But I suddenly realized, this is a fold. This is, Exactly what you want, you only need the binary operation. You don't need to write your enary, your thing that takes an array and loops over. You've just got, you've got a reduce function, you've got a binary operation. Let's fold together all the things, and that is exactly the set, the set union monoid. <clears throat> all right, 
So there's a bunch of examples. I want to drill a bit more into some, some code. And uh, something that we've all seen, I, I don't doubt, many, many examples of code for, probably written some ourselves. It's, it's the kind of API that contains monoids all over it, but they seldom get surfaced. They, and so we seldom get to use the power of them. Um, anytime we write code to deal with configuration, we very commonly merge these things. We have, uh, we have logic like, well, I'll take some configuration first from you know, the file, the, the common file, then from the file for this user, and I'll overlay that. Then I'll take command line arguments, and they'll be highest priority. You know, these kind of things are, are common. Uh, and serialization formats like JSON and protocol buffers support this kind of thing. Now, what I've just said, all that overlaying stuff, those are monoidal operations. So this is straight from protocol buffers uh, documentation. <clears throat> And if we just look at the text here, we can see the clues that monoids are involved. It says, OK, so first, one of the first things it says, if the same field appears multiple times, the parser accepts the last value it sees. That last operation is a monoid operation. Uh, it's kind of overwriting with the last value. The merge from method, that, so all, single, all singular scalar fields in the latter instance replace those in the former. It's doing a combination of a couple of different monoid things here. The last operation and merging sets. Repeated fields are concatenated. You know, in the case of uh, vectors, it's doing the string, the, mon the free monoid on the vectors. So there's, there's two or three monoids in here. And then it goes on to say, we have elements that can be labeled optional. And this is something very similar to an identity element, right? So if you have an optional thing, and you can have a default value on it, that's like having an identity element in your monoid. Uh, I'll come back to that in a, in a second, that last operation I have an example of. <clears throat> but I want to talk about um, some problems that occur in real life code. So sometimes, sometimes you have a type, and increasingly when we have value types, uh, sometimes they don't have a good a good identity, or it's not obvious, because the obvious thing in C++ that we would do is say, well, I want the identity to be what I get when I default construct my type. And the problem with that is for types, well, sometimes for types that represent things in the real world, there is no good identity, because real world, the real world isn't platonic and mathematical, it's messy. Um, for things like color, you might say, well, the, the identity is black. And that might work for an operation you want to do with color. Or you might say the identity is fully transparent. right? And that might work for another operation you want to do with color. But So different operations might have different identities. So there's sometimes not a good thing we can put in the default constructor. Now, to get around this, you can use, um, if you have a thing which doesn't have a, a good identity, you might use std optional. In many ways, the point of optional is to provide a sentinel value outside of your type. And by doing that, it will give you an identity value. So as long as we have an associative operation on t's here, we have a monoid. Even if we don't have an identity on t, we have a monoid by wrapping it in an optional. And the optional will provide us with that identity. Here's, here's first and last. Now, when I gave this talk in Aspen, I had both first and last on here, and it was very confusing, so I switched them both to last. This is the thing we saw with protocol buffers, where whatever you see last overwrites what you've previously seen. So if we just have values, uh, then we don't have an identity, because there's nothing you could, in that top example, you, there's, there's no identity for the x value. You can't pass anything, oh, sorry, for the y value. You can't pass anything for y, which will give you back your x, quite, quite as I hope you can see. <clears throat> I'm trying not to use the words obvious, just, simply. Um, but uh, my idea is to make this code very simple. <laughs> so, so there's no identity in the top uh, example. 
But the bottom example gives us that identity now. So the here is last. This is just you know, such a simple operation that we would completely not even think of it as an operation, right? We completely look past it. And, but when we do that, it hides the structure of the code. Sometimes it's useful to you know, think of the simplest possible things as, as real operations, and they then elucidate the monoidal code structure. All right, so the other thing that sometimes occurs um, is monoids are fund fundamentally have the binary operation, but sometimes for efficiency reasons, you want to provide an enary operation. Uh, and you can do that more efficiently sometimes. Um, now, this is where we're sort of wandering away from mathematical monoids a bit, but basically, you have a few, you have a few choices. Uh, if you want to overload an operator, you get fold expressions for free. So you get the enary operation. Um, you can always, you know, this is C++, so we have many things we could do. You can always make a type and define some operations on it. And you can use uh, runtime polymorphism. You can do the same kind of thing at compile time with traits class and generic code. Uh, you can do something with concepts, or you can do you know, other variations. And in fact, concepts can probably supplement any of these. Um, so here's one, here's, here's my, one of, a, a take of mine on an attempt to write a generic sort of fold. <laughs> so you might do this if you were using traits classes. So I've got, I've got the numeric concept in there. Uh, and I've defined a, a mono traits, which is overridden for. The, the key thing here is that different operations are going to have different traits. So here's the traits for multiply. And my constraints on t, presumably it's a numeric. So, so um, I have to be able to construct it from 1, which is the multiply identity, and I need to be able to multiply two t's. And then I can write this uh, generic function, which uses a fold expression to fold my monoidal operation over the passed in t's. Uh, and I could provide monoid traits for, uh, for plus, for, you know, for any of those monoids we've seen. I could provide a traits class to enable me to use this generic function. Um, now, one thing here is that as usual, there's many, many caveats in C++. Just because I said it was numeric here doesn't mean that all of these t's are numeric, right? So I don't know. Maybe the, maybe the language has some, has some work to do here. There is a proposal for homogeneous uh, variadic function parameters, which might help this a little. But perhaps this is a reasonable way to go. This is my take at, at, at a generic fold. Um, OK. I have more examples, more complicated examples. Um, well, probably not complicated, but more complex. So uh, a really good thing to think about and think about how, how monoids apply in the real world, besides, you know, besides addition and multiplication, which are fairly toy examples. Uh, Statistics. Statistics are almost always monoidal. Um, and recognizing those properties is the key to knowing how to, how to treat them, how you can distribute them, etc. So again, thinking about, just thinking about addition, but always keeping in mind that this applies to many things, which I'll come to in a minute. <clears throat> just think about how the properties uh, unlock these abilities. Closeness seems like an obvious property. It's so obvious that we don't really think about it. But this is the key to bounded space on your machine. You know, things, you know, when you sum integers, you get an integer. You don't get an ever-increasing vector of integers. When you, when you hash things, when you min things, you get bounded space. Closeness is the key to bounded space. Associativity is the key to distribution. You can, you can farm out these streams of numbers to n machines and you know, ask the machines and sum them up 
at will, and you will get the same answer as if you had had just one machine taking the whole stream. So it's the key to distribution. It's also the key to distribution in time, right? You can have uh, a sum for you know, the, the one minute after 12, and then the next minute after that, and the next minute after that. If you keep, if, in fact, if you keep the sums at the tree nodes here, you can uh, get the sum over any period in time you want with a logarithmic operation. Because you can just ask for, you know, here's, here's the ones, here's the twos, here's the fours, the eights, et cetera. You can, you know, sort of intuit how you can span any time period just by adding up the right number of those, and you only need to do a logarithmic number of lookups in your tree. <clears throat> and the existence of the identity is the key to, well, the way I think about it is, is the key to operations, right? Because it means you can roll out new hardware without having to worry about hooking everything up and, and, and being exact from day one. You can just have it return zero to start with, and it'll work just fine in your cloud, right? Until you start feeding it data, you've got an identity, that's fine, everything's good. So you get piecemeal deployment because of, these, because of this particular monoidal property. All right, so here's a few examples of you know, more complex things that, that drive statistics. So we already covered max and min. <clears throat> Top n is the first sort of more complex, so they're not very complex yet, but it's just an extension of max and min. So max is top one, right? So you can imagine keeping top n. Exactly the same kind of operation, except instead of keeping a thing, you've got a vector of 10 things, say. Uh, mean, mean is very easy too. Uh, if you keep, you know, one way to do it is to keep the sum that you've seen and the number of things you've seen. Both of those are monoidally composable, and you simply, when you want to find the mean, you just divide through the arithmetic mean in this case. Uh, and this was the basis of an interview question that Blizzard used for many years, a rolling average. Histogram is another monoid. So just, just think about how histogram works. Buckets of counts. Well, we know how to sum up counts, and we know how to sum up vectors by doing member-wise addition. So if you've got a vector of counts, which is a histogram, you can have vector of, you know, you can have histogram on machine A or machine B or machine C. We know how to add all those together. When I say add, I mean any monoidal operation. And all of these are composable sort of all the way down. You could have a histogram of top ends. You know how to combine the histogram at the top level, you know how to combine each vector of top ends. You know, so it's so it's sort of monoids all the way down. They're they're very much composable. So in 2017, Nicholas Ormrod gave a CppCon talk. It was called Fantastic Algorithms and Where to Find Them. And in that talk, he uh, he described in particular several probabilistic algorithms. And all of these algorithms are have that monoidal structure, have that ability to be distributed, to, to, distributed across hardware, across time. And they all fundamentally work by keeping small amounts of state that we know how to combine monoidally. And that's the key to distributing them. So one of these in particular, um, who here has heard of hyperloglog? Okay, uh, less than 10 people. Uh, maybe, maybe sort of a seventh or an eighth of the, of the crowd. So I just want to give you a, an intuition for how hyperloglog works. Um, you know, without going into the, the, the many mathematics behind it. Uh, but so that you can see, you can get an intuition for why it can be uh, accumulated monoidally across hardware. So characteristics of an ideal hash function. Imagine you had a hash function that was perfect. A characteristic of that function is that you don't get any collisions, uh, which is sort of another way of saying that it's uniformly distributed. So. If you think about it, it's just hashing from the real numbers, line zero to one. After hashing n things, you'd expect n hash hits uniformly distributed, because nothing's colliding, it's an ideal hash function. That means in particular that the, the distance between any two hash hits 
would be sort of your expected value here, E. And in particular, the distance between zero and your first hit, i.e. the minimum value you've seen, would be E. And so this is a very simplistic slide, but this is basically the intuition behind hyperlog log. Um, bunch, of, bunch of things coming in. Say, for example, this is how you would count uh, unique logins on your website. So you see, in a month, you see a couple of billion logins. How many of those are unique? In order to find that out, hyperlog log would give you the answer. You hash each login ID, uh, and you, you basically keep track of the minimum hash you've seen, or you take some bits out of the hash and keep track of the minimum. And there's, there's mathematics behind it, but fundamentally, the intuition is that you can keep a, a file of things you've seen, and at a very modest cost, like all probabilistic algorithms work by you know, having a bounded error with how much CPU and how much memory you spend. With a modest cost, you can keep, uh, you can count billions of uniques with, say, 99% accuracy. Here's another example of a probabilistic uh, monoid, count min sketch. So if you've heard of a bloom filter, this is very similar to a bloom filter. The idea here is that we want to not just keep count of the number of uniques, but keep count of how many times each unique person has logged in. And again, the intuition behind this is we use several hash functions. So here's, here's three hash tables. Um, and when Alice logs in, we hash Alice three ways, and we increment the value at each of those positions. And then, and then Bob logs in, right? And we hash Bob three ways. And now, so you can see that Bob has collided with Alice on this second hash table. So it's probabilistic. Uh, but Bob doesn't collide with Alice everywhere. It's unlikely that he will, at least. <clears throat> and then Alice, maybe Alice logs in again later, and we increment the positions there again. Now, how do we find out how many times Alice has logged in today? We simply do a lookup instead of an update, and we take the minimum value that we see. We know that's an upper bound on how many times Alice must have logged in. Now, that's the intuition behind count min sketch. What you'll notice here is that what we have is, in fact, not just a monoid, but a full abelian group, which is to say, not only, is, not only can we combine these things with associativity, we can combine them, they're commutative, right? Because we're using addition under the hood. So we could keep these hash tables on multiple machines and we'd know how to combine the hash tables um, because we know how to combine the elements at each index of the hash table. And because we're using addition, it happens to be commutative and it happens to have an inverse. So we could, we could take out, you know, we could remove some of Alice's logins as well. <clears throat> So those couple of examples show you that, uh, I hope, that um, statistics, um, monoids pervade statistics. And, and these properties of monoids in particular unlock those things. Um, the closeness gives us bounded space. The associativity gives us the ability to distribute either across hardware or across time. And the identity value helps with operations. And there's a great talk from Strange Loop in 2013 all about this if you're interested in, in, in more in terms of statistical uh, applications. <clears throat> now let's talk about uh, incremental computations, which, which you know, maybe you work in, in, in a space where the statistic stuff is applicable, but maybe you don't. Um, m many of us perhaps work in, in spaces where incremental computations are important. So earlier on, I showed you this example of, uh, of, this, of this pairwise monoid, this computation and, and keeping the uh, timing of the, the profiling of the computation. And I, and I said at the time, you know, we'd, we'd compose the functions. Um, function composition is a monoid. So um, A to B and B to C, you compose those together, you conceptually get a function from A to C. But for now, let's just, because we're thinking about incremental computation, I want to think about functions from A to A, right? Say from int to int, like we saw earlier. And uh, I want to talk about iota. This is iota. I called my guinea pig iota. 
Um, I, so IOTA is a function in the standard library, and it does this. It, it usually is thought of as filling a range with incrementing values. <clears throat> but there's a, some kind of monoidal structure lurking in IOTA that I think isn't fully realized by the standard library. So I want to take a look at this. A good way to sort of expose monoidal structure is to try writing the thing as an accumulate. So let's do that. <clears throat> so I've replaced the guts of iota with accumulate. Of course, accumulate takes a function which takes two arguments. So we're getting, the first argument is the accumulator, it's the so far argument. And we're going to write that into next and increment it each time. So this, this uh, does the same thing as iota. Now, for the language lawyers out there, Accumulate is not allowed to alter it, the things that it gets. So this is technically undefined behavior because we're using accumulate in a way inconsistent with its conditions. Um, but we, but you know, we, we're just doing a thought experiment right now. So the the increment here. Sorry, I keep shining the thing there, and you can't see that one. The <laughs> the increment is the is the monoidal operation in a sense here. And we can think earlier about, I mentioned count and count if. Those are the same kind of things. Um, so we can generalize this a bit more by saying, well, the increment is the monoidal operation. So let's actually make it an operation, any monoidal operation that we can pass in. Um, for example, you know, any unary function. So we just replace that, and we generalize the increment. We pulled out that plus 1. And now we're getting towards something more generic. And I've called this iterate. So I've replaced that unary function with a function, uh, an endo function, i.e. a function from a's to a's, ints to ints, t's to t's, whatever. Function from one thing to the same thing, which is a unary operation. And now we have uh, this, this new algorithm, an algorithm which isn't in the standard yet. Uh, but allows us to put in any operation and effectively do what IOTA does. So, so IOTA can be rewritten trivially as just pass in the plus one operation. Uh, we could put in many different operations in there. So, you know, it's not easy to think about non-toy things. So I wanted to put an example of a thing which isn't necessarily a toy. Uh, I come from the games industry. Um, there's a lot of procedural generation that goes on in games. And uh, so I want to talk a bit about maze generation. Now, there are lots of different algorithms for generating mazes, or equivalently spanning trees. Um, some of these you might have heard of. You know, if you've done a CS course, you've probably heard of crims and cross schools. Uh, prims and cross schools. Um, there's a bunch of them. The last one here is very interesting, Ella's algorithm, because how Ella's algorithm works is by generating the next row of the maze from the previous row. And, and here's how it does that. Uh, you don't necessarily need to understand it now, uh, but it's not that difficult to understand. But the key thing is that you, you take your, your row that you have, you do some operations by like knocking down walls between cells, you knock down walls to the, to the next row, and you've got your next row. And you, iterate that operation. So in, in a picture, it might look like this. Conceptually, each cell of your row is in a different set. right? You carve down the walls, and you link together, uh, you link together cells and put them in the same set. And then you carve walls to the south, as it were. And you end up with a new, a new row where you've got some of them uh, are in those same sets. And the ones that aren't, you just assign them to new sets. And you keep doing this until, until you've had enough. <clears throat> um, so that algorithm is uh, very susceptible, as you can see, to our, to our iterate. Um, by, by unlocking the, the structure underlying, uh, now I have a demo for this. I think perhaps I'll do it at the end, because this talk was originally 90 minutes, and it's now one hour. Uh, but I, I have it ready to go at the end. So incremental computation, or streaming, um, it, it uses frequently this functional composition monoid. 
And if we can recognize that and try and extract the state, we get that ability to do the incremental computation or the streaming computation, you know, either at scale or in the comfort of your own CPU. <coughs> now, a little bit segueing on from that, I want to talk about a, a scary word, um, but it's a $25 term for a five cent concept. Monoid, a monoid homomorphism. This is the kind of thing you can look up on Wikipedia uh, and read about and be none the wiser. You can understand everything it says intellectually and just have no intuition for it at all when you finish reading. <coughs> and the, the, the example you always find is uh, string concatenation versus integer addition. So the length function on a string, right? It converts one monoid into another. The monoid is string concatenation and the monoid you know, over here is integer addition. To convert between one monoid and the other, string length is the function. And, and you know, so string length zero, zero is the, is the identity under addition, right? So all the structure of the monoid is preserved, but the monoids are different. Now, as I said, you've, you've all totally intellectually understood that, but maybe have no intuition as to why it's useful or important or anything like that. This is typically what happens when you read about maths on Wikipedia. <coughs> But, but actually, we do this all the time because we very commonly do calculations in different spaces because they're easier or easier to think about or easier to code, more efficient, something like that. Um, some of you may be able to guess what this does. Uh, well, may, maybe if you were programming in the 90s. <laughs> um, if I told you that R and I stand for real and imaginary, and here's this less than four, you, you might sort of intuit that this, this actually produces an ASCII art, a small ASCII art Mandelbrot set. Um, but this was sort of a very obfuscated example, but an early example, and a sort of, you know, this less than four. So when you produce a, when you do a Mandelbrot set calculation, what you do to decide whether or not a point is in the Mandelbrot set is you do the iteration of the function, and if, that ever, if your answer ever goes outside the circle of radius two, you know that it's going to escape to infinity, right? So that's not in the set. But, but we don't, there's no square root here, right? We, this is an example of doing a calculation in another space because it's easier. There'd be no point in square rooting B and comparing it to two. No, we just compare it to four. And we commonly do this in all kinds of things. So, you know, historically I was in the games industry. Um, if you want to know, you know, if an object is in a player's field of view, you would do, you know, player's facing vector, vector from player to object, dot product, so project the one onto the other. Um, you know, and the, uh, one of the intuitions for dot product is, you know, magnitude of two vectors times the angle between them, right? So we're basically trying to find out what's the angle between these two normalized vectors. Um, but we don't do an inverse cosine because that would be silly. We just hard code, you know, the cosine of 45 degrees or whatever. <laughs> so we're doing that calculation in a different space. And it's the, same, it's the same story when we think about logarithms or we think about Fourier transformations, Laplace transformations. These are all common monoid homomorphisms or transformations from one space to another. So uh, here's, a, here's a good example of, here's a, you know, example of that. So what's the best way to compute the nth Fibonacci number? That's right, multiply some weird matrix. Uh, so Fibonacci is a, is a linear, there you go, raise a matrix to the nth power. Um, and if you've seen, uh, I think Sean Parent showed this on stage um, in one of his talks. So the Fibonacci sequence is a function, conceptually a function from two numbers to the next two numbers, because, you know, because it uses some history. I'm gonna cast it in that mold. So, and you know, the action of this, we all know the Fibonacci sequence, we know what this does. This is a function from A's to A's, so it's composable with itself. But in C++, we don't have a good way to express the, the monoid of function composition. Like, we can't do that efficiently or well, really. So, but we can con sort of convert this into matrix multiplication. 
And multiplication, we know how to do very efficiently, and we know how to do it in logarithmic time with raising to a power. So this is sort of an example of, a hide, I think, a hiding monoid homomorphism. Now, Fibonacci is a toy, so I'm going to give you a real life example of where this is actually applicable. So a linear congruential random number generator is fundamentally a function from A's to A's. And it's fundamentally, you know, a, 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 a multiply and an add, which is basically a multiply with some stuff, some extra stuff. So if we could transform this, we could make this function, which is in the standard library, and you'll, in your favorite um, you know, random number generator in the standard library, you'll find this discard function, which is just saying, advance my random number generator by n steps. And on cppreference.com, it says, for some engines, fast jump algorithms are known. In fact, when I gave this talk in Aspen, um, Marshall was sitting in the front row. He's the standard library implement, uh, a standard library implementer. He was taking notes, because I don't think neither libc++ nor libstudc++ actually do any of these fast jump algorithms at the moment. Maybe they do, because he's had a month to work on it. But. So, um, like I said, so advancing a pseudo-random number generator, a linear congruential generator, is just basically a multiply and add, which is just basically a multiply, which if you look in the literature, this kind of thing has been known for ages. This is, this is how advanced, this is, and you don't need to really look at this in detail. This is just doing some mods and adds and stuff. But the thing to look at here is, while n greater than 0, shift n. So this is obviously a logarithmic time loop, right? We're dividing n by 2 each time through the loop. This is logarithmic time skip ahead achieved by recognizing that monoidal operation of function composition and thinking, well, maybe we can do something with that. And there's plenty of literature on this. Um, here is random number generation with arbitrary strides, which is uh, one of the papers that I looked at, and I'm sure Marshall is, has notes on these. Um, and some, some pseudo-random number generators can actually run backwards as well as forwards. Uh, and it's not just linear congruential ones that are susceptible to this kind of approach. Um, XOR shift and PCG both can, can do this as well. But I think in, in, you know, in, in thinking about why these things or how these things are monoids, at least to me, it elucidates the structure and makes it sort of, even though, you know, so I didn't sit down and derive this from scratch. I'm not really a mathematical uh, whiz. Uh, but in just thinking about the structure of the code, it clued me into, oh, you know, this could be possible. And so I know what to search for now. And so I can, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and get this, these kind of speed ups in my code. So when you do spot a monoid, wonder if there's a, you know, if you, if you, have, some oper if you have something you want to do with it that's maybe expensive, you just, you just wonder whether there's a, something that somebody already knows about to convert it into another space, uh, either because you can do more in that space or you can do things faster, or sometimes you can just think more easily. So now we're entering the section of the talk that I cut out because there was way too much. Uh, but I will go through it briefly. When you start looking for monoids, you find them literally everywhere. They are ubiquitous. Um, all of these things under, under some interpretations are monoids. So you, you hear a lot about monadic futures, uh, and, and they are, but they're also monoidal. If you think about, uh, if you think about racing two futures, if you think about the when any operation, so I'm, I'm running a computation, and conceptually, I have another future which is maybe representing the user hitting the cancel button. It's a cancellation future, right? So I'm running some, some operation, the cancellation future. Uh, whichever one of those completes first will be the result of my future, right? That's when any. Um, now, that is an associative operation. I can combine futures associatively, and you can sort of think about how that works and convince yourself. And that's also got an identity, which is if the user never hits the cancel button, right? So the future that never completes 
is the identity for, for racing futures together. Uh, parsers are monoids under sort of alternation. So try one parser. If it doesn't work, try the next one. You alternate them together. Um, and that forms a monoid. Again, that's an associative operation. And the identity is the parser that always fails. And uh, I used that approach, Jason and I used that approach when we did our, our constexpr talk with a JSON parser a couple of years ago. And we used the parser that always fails as a method to give, admittedly, not very good error messages. <clears throat> if you have a large set of data and you want to train a distribution on that data, sometimes you can, this is an example of a monoid homomorphism. Instead of you know, let's say I have six months worth of data and I run a long running operation, it takes me a couple of days to crunch that data down to a distribution, right? Uh, but it takes me a couple of days, right? So in those couple of days, I've got another two days of data. So rather than running over six months and two days and taking all that time again, maybe there's a way for me to just run over that last day of data and get a distribution from that, and then rather than combining the whole data sets, I'll just combine the distributions, right? And maybe I can get the same answer or an answer that's sufficiently similar, uh, at least for a while, that I don't have to run that long running computation more than once a week or something. So training sets frequently can give rise to you know, monoidal uh, operations on the distributions that are produced. There is, uh, there is a web page out there which demonstrates how to do regular expression matching monoidally using a very similar idea. Um, uh, similar kind of thing, let's say you have a massive corpus of text and you want to uh, run a regular expression to find a match in there, and then you, and then you change the corpus just a tiny bit, you, know, you add a character to the end, right? Instead of running the whole regular expression again, there's a way to incrementally do that. So the idea of training sets and, and, and matching show you that monoids are useful for this incremental computation. And then we've talked about um, accumulate in a binary operation sense, but it's also applicable to tree structures. Uh, and, I, and I went over this a little bit in my, in my talk on accumulate a couple of years ago. Uh, but basically, the intuition here is that, um, so in functional languages, uh, what we call a vector, they would call a list, is often modeled as a, as, a, as a variant, either the empty list or the list with one element and a tail, which is itself a list, right? So functional languages commonly model an, a vector or, or a list, as they say, with that. So <clears throat> you can think about accumulate as acting on those two cases. The, the identity value sort of acts on the case where we've got the empty vector, and the binary operation acts on the case where we've got the T and tail of Ts. So if you have rather, if you think of a vector in that sense, then you can think of a tree in a similar sense as a, as a variant, right? A tree of left branch or right branch or, or leaf. Uh, sorry, or leaf node or branch node of left and right, right? And so then if you provide operations for dealing with each of those cases, you can very similarly write a fold over a tree in the same way that we're all used to having a fold running over a linear sequence. And the list goes on and on. So I hope that having seen examples, real, and hopefully not just toy examples, but semi-real world examples, um, this has now got you thinking about your own code Maybe, maybe there are some monoids lurking. I'm sure there are monoids lurking there. Maybe you can take advantage of them. Um, because when you, when you recognize them, it helps you to think about separating control flow from logic. And you get the benefits that I've, that I've described. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll take questions. If you want to see the demo also, I have that. Um, uh, you are, your focus uh, about file finding mon monoids is uh, mostly about computation. And, right. Uh, in the code, there's also another level of 
where you can f you could find monoids in uh, design patterns, for example. If you, are, you think about the composite pattern, where you compo compose... The composite pattern, yes. Or, or, or even simpler, the decorator pattern. Mm -hmm. you, have, uh, you, have, you see that the monoids everywhere there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the composite pattern is my absolute favorite pattern. <laughs> are they useful? Do you think it's useful to uh, think about monoids in uh, in, in the structure of code as opposed to the evolution of computation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I said about, you know, applying monoids to a tree structure is very much in the vein of, of composite, a composite pattern. So, yeah, all of this stuff kind of helps you destructure your code and think about it more clearly. All right, I don't see questions. I'm going to try and pull up a demo. And to do that, I will need to quickly take that. Bear with me. Um. Sorry, I needed to compile this. Hopefully we should be good. Okay, so I will show you, first of all, perhaps I will show you uh, the code. everyone see that well enough? Yes? No? Maybe? Um, so there's a bunch of sort of generic code and then here's, so here's the bit that, that counts. Here's the maze algorithm. So we do some setup uh, where we make the first row, basically here's our row. Um, and here's the call to iterate and the, here is the um, yeah, here's the lambda that I pass into iterate. So to make the next row from the previous row, all we do is uh, copy it. Uh, sorry, we, we we get the next row. Yeah, there's the next row function, and then we then we make our decisions to, as to what to do for this row, and then we return it. And so when we run iterate, we create each row from the next row, and then. When we're done, we just we do some fix up for the there's a small fix up step for the last row when you decide you're finished. Okay, so that's the code. Now, if I just get rid of that and try and show you the where are we? Uh, all right. I don't know if you can see, but um, now I think I hooked this up to take two arguments, the, basically the width and the height of the maze. And so if I run it with, uh, let's say, 32, 32, we get a maze that's 32 by 32. Uh, if, I, if I do other bin time of that, we'll see that, well, it's uh, about three, 3476 max resident K, right? So that was for 32 by 32. If I run, I forget, is the first argument the width or the height? Or the second argument is the width, okay. First argument is the height. So if I run, this is where the projector's gonna, or my machine's gonna, so there's 1000. If I, if I time that, 
we're going to get exactly the same memory usage because there was no, you know, so three and a half megabytes, the same as 32. And if I run a million, it'll be, you know, it'll keep going for a long time, but it'll never, basically by using that iterate function, we, yeah, it, it, will, it will just keep going. And this is an old laptop, and I'm not sure how the projector is coping with, with this, but basically you would see at the end that the memory usage was the same because we just used iterate to make the next row from, from the previous row. And as you saw, the code was about 10 lines. So fairly useful example, which is perhaps less of a, a toy than I could have otherwise picked. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>